Welcome to the second installment of Explorations in the Medical Humanities. My name is Lan Lee. I am a postdoc fellow with the Presidential Scholars of Society and Neuroscience. Um, and my co-organizers, my illustrious co-organizers, include Carmel Raz, Heidi Haas, and Arden Hegley. Um, and they're, uh, all three of them are with the Society of Fellows. And this series is being sponsored by the Society of Fellows, the Heyman Center um, for the Humanities, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, and the Center for Science and Society. So I have to say, hey, you can sit here. Um, so I have to say that this particular um, talk today, Beyond Mindfulness, Buddhism and Health and Historical Perspective, is organized in part on my own ignorance because um, medicine as a body of knowledge is inseparable from philosophy, cosmology, and religion, and it's also a system of practices that's framed by social structures and economic forces, and it depends on material objects. Um, but for me, as a historian of science in the 19th and 20th century, a lot of the political and social discourse tends to mask the epistemic and experimental practices that join philosophy, uh, medicine, cosmology, <coughs> and religion in the transnational global context. So we're opening the conversation today with historical perspectives to question these dichotomies between medicine, religion, uh, science, and ritual through critiquing a, a contemporary fixation on mindfulness. So, oh my gosh, he's Ellen. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Pierce, Professor Pierce Alguero, who comes to us from Penn State Abington. Oh, these are, I meant to show the other thoughts in our series. Uh, and, right. Um, so, uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Pierce Salguero, who comes to us from Penn State Abington. Um, and you're in the Department of Asian, Asian History and Religious Studies, or is that not? It's, it's a division of humanities. It's a, so a that's, division. That's my title. <laughs> from the, who comes to us in the Division of Humanities. Um, so Pierce primarily focuses on the global transmission and local reception of Buddhist knowledge about health disease and the body. And so he approaches this topic from a variety of methods in history, religious studies, translation studies, literary, literature studies, anthropology, which really speaks to the interdisciplinary scope of medical humanities. Um, and in many ways, he's also the founder of a new field of Buddhist medicine, which extends across geopolitical boundaries. And among his other publications, Pierce has rallied a number of scholars in a project that surveys a global history of Buddhism and medicine, in his words, from Sinai to Silicon Valley, um, which has resulted in the first of two anthologies of primary sources in Buddhist medicine. Um, Pierce is also a medical practitioner and has taught a number of students in this capacity. So engaging with Pierce in conversation is our respondent, Michael Como, who is the Toshu Fukami Professor of Shinto Studies at Columbia. So Michael focuses on religious history in the Japanese islands from the 5th to 10th centuries, in particular on the transmission of Chinese and Korean deities, as well as the transmission of rites and technological systems. So his recent books include Shotoku, Ethnicity, Ritual, and Violence in the Formation of Japanese Buddhism, as well as Weaving and Binding, Immigrant Gods and Female Immortals in Ancient Japan. Um, and so his current book, book project looks at urbanization and the materiality of performance and soundscapes and the interpretation and interpretation in Japanese religion in the 8th and 9th centuries. So this is just uh, the end of the formalities. In terms of format, we'll have Pierce introduce his research for about half an hour. Michael will give his response, and then we'll open up the discussion to the rest of the room. So, Pierce. Thank you. Um, thank you, Land, for the invitation to come and for, um, to the center for uh, allowing me to be here and for all of the colleagues and friends that I see in the room. Uh, thanks for coming out and everybody else. Um, it's my, my great pleasure and honor to be here today speaking with you. And um, I understand that there's sort of a mixed group here of people from Buddhist studies, from medical humanities, people who may not know anything about Buddhism or Asia. Uh, and so in speaking with Lan about what, how, how would I uh, talk to this, this group, what uh, we decided would be best was for, for me to sort of give you a, uh, a 
broad and a, and a brief uh, introduction to my current research project and um, to sort of uh, open it up for discussion. And I think what I'm going to do here is probably leave a lot of unresolved questions as sort of a breadcrumb trail behind me as I go that I invite everybody here to pick up and um, uh, address maybe in the, in the discussion to follow. Uh, so as, as Lan was saying, um, my background is uh, rather interdisciplinary. I was a practitioner of Asian medicine. Uh, I, my, I majored in anthropology as an undergraduate. I, my PhD is in the history of medicine. I work on Buddhism, so I've come at this particular project from a lot of different angles, and so it's that kind of conversation, these kind of interdisciplinary conversations that I'm most excited about having, so uh, let's have it. Um, hopefully you didn't come because you're interested in mindfulness. Um, <laughs> the word in my title um, uh, was preceded by the word beyond mindfulness, right? So um, uh, I do think, though, it used to be I didn't even start with a slide about mindfulness. Um, I just launched right into, uh, you know, early Asia. But, um, but these days with mindfulness becoming more and more high profile uh, in the popular media, such as in Time Magazine, um, I'm finding it more and more um, that I'm not able to really speak about what I want to talk about unless I start from the standpoint of mindfulness um, and the mindful, the so-called mindful revolution that time has declared that we are now undergoing. Um, I, if, you're, if you're at all interested in mindfulness, you're probably aware both of the breathless coverage in the popular media, but then also of a, a, a wave, I would say, maybe a backlash, maybe a wave of critique against or critique of mindfulness that is um, uh, being made in scholarly circles, maybe not quite as much press as the, uh, the, the, the mindful revolution. Um, but in, in uh, my reading of this uh, material, what I'm seeing most, most critiques, or not, not all critiques, but, but many critiques are clustering around these three kind of areas. Um, the first being uh, the notion of the, the sort of scientific nature of um, the, the mindfulness research. The second is that mindfulness is complicity with neoliberal capitalism, uh, the third one being um, how white mindfulness seems to be. Um, and I'm not engaging with any of these um, critiques of mindfulness. Um, what I want to do is actually to uh, contextualize Buddhism and Buddhist engagements with health within a much larger story than mindfulness or than uh, late 20th century. Um, so. My interest in uh, Buddhist ideas about healing goes back to uh, my experience shortly after graduating from college, traveling to Asia. Uh, I spent several years living in Southeast Asia, India, China, and really experiencing firsthand how on the ground uh, Buddhism and healthcare are very closely intertwined. And I, I, I saw that both in Buddhist monastic settings and also in traditional medicine settings, hospitals and, and, and uh, uh, centers for the study of traditional medicine in Asia. Uh, so my interests were, were piqued by these experiences. I went into graduate school and I've kind of devoted myself to, to this question of the interrelation between Buddhism and medicine um, for the last, I guess, oh, 20 years now. Um, I've been looking at that from various different angles. Uh, so. As a master's degree student, I looked at Thai medicine. As a PhD student, I looked at medieval China. Um, and now, I'm, uh, last couple of years, I have been working on a three-volume um, project, which happens to be um, published by um, Columbia University Press. So um, any representatives from the press here? No? <laughs> they, they, would, they would want me to show you. And I'm quite proud to show you the first volume that is, has just uh, uh, just been mailed to me on Friday, on, uh, yeah, on Friday or Saturday. It arrived in my mailbox, um, and I'm also quite happy to say that there are uh, at least three people in the room whose work is represented in this volume as well. So um, uh, it is uh, uh, the first in a three-volume um, project, and um, the intention here is for the first two volumes to be anthologies of primary sources from. Uh, pre-modern Asia, and then from modern and contemporary global context, that's the second volume. And the third volume is a synthetic 
uh, narrative, single authored narrative history of the relationship between Buddhism and medicine globally over the last 25 some odd hundred years uh, and, and, and to do so succinctly in the span of 200 pages or so um, as a way of kind of providing some cohesion between what I see as being related fields of study um, that haven't been brought together, I don't think, um, before. Um, so individual scholars who are working on, um, say, early Japan, medieval China, contemporary uh, biomedical settings, um, bringing them together into a common, uh, under a common rubric of Buddhism and medicine, or Buddhist medicine, as the case may be. Um, so this is what I want to talk about today. I'm just going to give you sort of an overview of that project. I'm going to do it really <laughs> rather quickly. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover, and like I said, there'll be hopefully plenty of time for, um, for some discussion afterwards. Um, so I wanted to start with just um, briefly giving an overview of the, um, the, the, what, what we can see through early Buddhist texts about medicine in early India. Um, so the earliest texts that we have from, from India, from the Buddhist tradition, are committed to writing around the first century BCE. Uh, they represent, ostensibly, several centuries of oral tradition um, before that. And anybody who's studied Buddhism is going to know these things, these bullets I'm going to put up here. This is for the benefit of those of you who are less familiar with Buddhism. Um, the first point to make is that uh, Buddhism quite self-consciously sees itself and speaks of itself, that is to say, Buddhists speak of their tradition as uh, a solution for human illness, or human suffering, uh, human sufferings of all kinds, of which there's a, sort of a common uh, formulation of either four or eight primary forms of human suffering, of which illness is always one. Uh, so Buddhism sets itself, sets out from the beginning uh, a notion that, that Buddhism has something to say about how to overcome the suffering of illness. Um, in, in many cases, how Buddhists talk about overcoming the suffering of illness is through a sort of stoicism, a kind of reflection on the impermanence of the human body, uh, an acceptance of the impermanence of human life, etc. Um, and that certainly is a major uh, strain, a major refrain that we see in, in Buddhist texts. Uh, however, medicine pops up everywhere within the Buddhist tradition. It's, it's in all kinds of genres, and, and it appears in all kinds of different um, uh, uh, guises and forms, um, in addition to the sort of philosophical reflections on detachment that I just mentioned. Uh, so there are many, for example, narratives uh, or similes or um, uh, parables that involve illness, healing, um, uh, uh, some kind of medical care, nursing care, etc. Uh, but I just wanted to draw your attention to this mosaic. This is a, this must be three stories high, uh, mosaic in the entrance of a Buddhist hospital in Taiwan that I'll come back to at the end of my talk. Uh, but this is a, uh, a, a depiction of a narrative in which the Buddha comes across a monk who's sick within the monastic complex. Uh, the monk hasn't been cared for by the other monks. The Buddha cares for him with his own hands and then sort of chastises the monks after the fact saying um, that monks are required to care for one another, give each other medical and nursing care within the monastic uh, community. Um, there are many reflections on the healing benefits of various contemplative practices that are also found in these early Buddhist texts. Um, it's not mindfulness, MBSR style, right? It's, it's um, it's not, um, uh, in, in many ways, it's not very consonant with the ways that, that, that um, we are studying and understanding the effects of meditation today in the modern period. Um, but there are many, um, uh, many texts that will discuss a patient who's sick, a, a monk, sometimes it's the Buddha himself, um, experiencing some kind of uh, transformation of that illness, or relief from that illness directly because of contemplate, contemplative practices, contemplation of some aspect of the Dharma um, or of some kind of quality of, of, of um, uh, practice. Um, the early Indian Buddhist texts happen to be the place where we first see in writing 
the Indian medical doctrines that are going to wind up in the Ayurvedic medical classics. So the, 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 the kind of the written, the literary uh, medical traditions, classical medicine of India, um, those texts aren't written until several centuries after the Pali Canon. Um, so again, those texts are also based on oral history, on, on oral transmission beforehand going back several centuries. Um, it's very difficult to say which one came first, but in terms of being written down, the Pali um, is written down earlier, uh, and in the Pali canon we have mentions of um, Indian medical doctrines, um, some, some very kind of foundational Indian medical doctrines such as the four elements, the three doshas, I don't know if this means anything to anybody here, these are kind of basic principles of Indian medicine. Um, and then finally, uh, last but certainly not least is the monastic disciplinary literature. Uh, so we have both in Pali but then also in um, Sanskrit and in Chinese translation, uh, we have um, in existence uh, a, a very large um, uh, corpus of not only monastic disciplinary rules but then a number of commentaries on those rules and interpretations of those rules as well. So those texts are filled with references not to medicine in the abstract or in the philosophical, but to actual uh, medical practices. Um, each one of the main monastic disciplinary texts, the Vinyas, have um, a, a section that is dedicated to the rules uh, that, re that are uh, relevant to the, um, the, the storage, the collection, the storage, and the usage of medicine. Um, and in those, in those uh, vinyas, the, the, the sort of the narrative frequently goes that, you know, such and such a monk was sick with whatever disease. The monks come to the Buddha and they say, he's sick, we need to give him X medicine, or we need to do X procedure. Um, we need to find a doctor who can do X procedure. Uh, and the Buddha normally assents and says, yes, this is allowable, you can do this. Um, so narratively, it's not very interesting, but in terms of the... Um, in terms of the sheer number of diseases and and remedies that the, that are introduced in this way, it's actually um, the monastic disciplinary literature is actually a very important source for the history of medicine in, in India. Again, many of these texts predating um, anything like this from the Ayurvedic tradition. Um, so a lot. So I'm not a uh, scholar of India. And uh, a lot of what I've been talking about is based on the scholarship of, of, um, of other people, including people who have contributed to this book. Um, my, my research really, um, in terms of looking at primary sources and, and, and going in depth into um, Buddhist uh, ideas about medicine that are coming from the Chinese context. Um, don't, don't put too much stock in these bubbles that are on my map here. This is meant to be sort of schematic, not, not accurate. Um, but what I want to, the point I want to make here, um, as I show you this this map, is that um, India, and the, India is very closely connected historically. Ancient India is very closely connected historically with uh, with the Greco-Roman world. We know this through um, various exchanges in art and science and literature and so forth. Uh, but it's very clear that the the medical ideas that develop in India. Ayurvedic tradition and also the, 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 the medical concepts that we find in the Buddhist texts, that they have a close affinity, let's say, with Greco-Roman medicine. Um, there's many of many of um, cognate concepts, um, and and this I'm, I'm meaning my map to show you that there is a, uh, a, a, a while there's an affinity between European and Indian medicine, there's a gap between those forms of medicine and uh, Chinese medicine, which develops in a very different context and develops very different. Um, conceptual, uh, metaphorical, and practical um, uh, applications. So um, this is something we can talk about in the Q&A if we're interested in sort of a comparison of Indian and Chinese medicine. Um, what, I, what I'm interested in for the moment is just pointing out the role that Buddhism plays in transporting some of these ideas and some of these practices from the Indo-European world across the Silk Road, around the maritime routes, into East Asia. Um, and that's been the primary sort of um, area of research that I've been involved in um, up to this point myself in terms of primary sources and, and uh, in-depth research. Um, so my research has been looking at how these foreign medical concepts and, and, and models and metaphors 
how they're dealt with in Chinese translation. So how Chinese translators um, choose to uh, uh, either find equivalent concepts in the Chinese indigenous language that can be used to gloss these foreign ideas, or how they might um, uh, transliterate these Sanskrit words into Chinese characters in order to sort of preserve their foreignness, their, their, their um, uh, flagging them as, as knowledge that's external to China. And I, I spent a lot of time in my last book looking at the social dynamics behind those kinds of translation decisions. Um, in any case, uh, I, 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 as I have been sort of working through these problems, I started to think about Buddhism as like a, a, a sort of something of a vehicle or something of a, of a catalyst for medical exchange uh, in not only between India and China, but then also between India and, and, and other parts of this um, uh, trade system. Um, the map here shows you, uh, it's a map of the expansion of Buddhism. It also is a map of the major trade routes in, in first millennium uh, CE Asia. Um, uh, as as some of as many of you I'm sure know, the Silk Roads uh, maritime routes really become uh, uh, major major um, sites for cross cultural exchange in the first several centuries CE. Uh, and as we move forward by 500 700 AD, um, the Entire region that's shown here on the map with all of the all of the lines uh, is engaging in Buddhist um, exchanges. Uh, so from Indonesia to Japan, all the way out to eastern Iran, um, including uh, China, Afghanistan, Tibet, um, Sri Lanka. Uh, the, these are all places where Buddhist um, culture, Buddhist discourses, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist texts are being transmitted and transported. Very different forms of Buddhism um, are developing in these different regions, um, but there, there, there is something of a network of exchange um, that's, that's taking place here. Uh, and um, I, I don't think it's controversial to point out that there are certain nodes where the, in these networks where it seems like those names of those places keep coming up again and again and again. Um, there's sites for the collection of texts and the translation of texts. There's sites of important monastic complexes. There's sites uh, where people from different cultures are coming together and exchanging uh, Buddhist knowledge, Buddhist practices with one another. Um, so I, I, I put a couple of these up here um, um, that specifically relate to medicine. Um, I might point out just one example and focus on Nalanda, which is in the east, uh, eastern part of India on the map there, um, and just share with you one, one example. It, it, it may be common knowledge for the, half the room that's here from Buddhist studies. Um, but we have records, uh, first-hand records written by a Chinese pilgrim named Yi Jin, who in the 7th century uh, travels the route that you can see here from China uh, down to um, to Srivijaya uh, in, in um, modern day Indonesia. He spent several years learning Sanskrit there and then continues onwards to India, eventually arriving in Nalanda where he spends um, several years in a monastic curriculum there that uh, he later reports back to China. Um, he writes translates many, many texts that he brings back to China with him, um, but he also writes um, some reflections on his time uh, in India, and in one of these um, texts, he has several chapters he dedicates to various health practices, medical um, uh, practices, and, and, and other kinds of um, uh, health and healing knowledge. Um, what he's trying to do in that text is report back to China what they do in India. Um, he's trying to reform the the, the, the monastic um, order in China, uh, but from the standpoint of medical history, it's it's a uh, it's it's a it's a very interesting first-hand account of uh, what's happening. It's probably idealized in many ways, but it's it, anyway it's a first-hand account of what's happening in a Buddhist monastery um, in seventh-century India. Um, that's just one example of many I, I I I could have chosen to talk about sort of the the travel circulation and the travel between nodes within this um, larger network. Um, so so um, I frequently get the, get a question um, 
from from people who are hearing about this project for the first time. Um, you know how 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 Buddhist is this medicine, or how medical is this Buddhism, or what's what's the relationship between Buddhism and, and, and medicine as you see it? Um, so I'm going to say this really quickly, and we can dig into it a little more if we want to in the Q and A. Um, I'm I'm using the term Buddhist medicine rather loosely. I, I try to make this clear in my in my writings that I'm not putting hard boundaries around this entity and saying that there's a kind of a uh, uh, a thing that moves from place to place and travels all around Asia. Rather, what I'm saying is that there's a kind of a there, that there's a Buddhist um, uh, flavor to the way that that um, uh, uh, these various texts and these various people deal with uh, medicine. There's a Buddhist uh, quality to it that is, I think, identifiable uh, and, and and different, identifiably different than other medical discourses. Um, I've started to say, just to make to sort of like make the point, is that I'm thinking of Buddhist medicine the way that an art historian might refer to Buddhist art, or a philosopher might refer to Buddhist philosophy. That is to say, there's no one smoking gun thing that is the core of Buddhist medicine, but it's rather a, a, a set of features, a set of practices, a set of kind of philosophical impulses um, that, that we find um, traveling from place to place, and that we find frequently being associated with Buddhist institutions, Buddhist writers, we find them in Buddhist texts. Um, so what, is that, what does that consist of? This is by no means a comprehensive list, it's just I'm meaning to suggest um, what some of the features of a Buddhist medicine are. Um, there are uh, these basic orientations, um, and, uh, such as the orientation towards um, uh, suffering of illness as being one of these forms of human suffering that can be dealt with uh, by Buddhism. Um, the notion of conceptual metaphors, maybe I'll leave that to the side for now. It's too, too much to get into, um, so I'm aware of my time, but we can come back to it if anybody's interested. Um, there, there are set, there are set uh, practices, a repertoire of healing practices that, that travel uh, with Buddhism, that are introduced um, along with Buddhism. Um, there are, of course, texts, uh, a large number of texts that relate directly to medicine. Um, that we find it, it being translated into various Asian languages. Um, the pharmaceutical trade and exchange and the exchange of material culture between um, uh, Buddhist countries is something that is, um, hasn't been studied as much as the exchange of ideas, but the, there, there is some scholarship on it. Um, iconographic similarities, iconographic uh, features um, that, uh, that, that relate specifically to healing or relate to, um, to medicine. Um, we have records of specific named practitioners. Um, uh, the Chinese records are, are quite rich in this regard, mentioning uh, monks from India, from Central Asia, from Southeast Asia, who are, who are in China, who are well known for performing various types of medical or healing um, rituals or interventions. Um, probably a lot of that is legendary, but it, it gives us a sense of, of sort of the ideals uh, of what foreign monk should be involved in in China. Um, the, uh, the institutions that we know about in China or in um, uh, India or in Tibet, there are, there are multiple institutions that we know about that are centers for medical learning. Um, some of the notes that I put up on the previous, uh, a couple slides ago, um, we have records of the uh, medical learning that takes place there. Uh, I Ching, when he's at Nalanda, for example, learning the monastic curriculum tells us that the monastic curriculum includes a, cor uh, a course of study on medicine. Uh, Dunhuang, which is on the Silk Road, it's a, a site that was noted as a node in that previous slide, um, had a, um, has a, a, a massive collection of um, documents that has been, was discovered in the early 20th century from that site, uh, many of which are medical in nature. They're, they include medical texts from India as well as from China, and a, and a large number of Buddhist um, uh, texts related to healing and medicine as well. Um, Hagiographic and narrative tropes. I think uh, you know these are they're, they're quite common um, stories uh, about medical uh, heroes that emerge within the Buddhist uh, literary canon that become. Uh, widely circulated. Uh, the Medicine Buddha by Shajaguru is shown here um, at the right from a, uh, a cave at Duwan. 
Um, and he's, he's just one example of a, a figure who is commonly found associated with medical uh, rituals, medical iconography, uh, medical practices of all kinds. Um, so so he, he would be an example of um, sort of a, repeat, a recurring uh, figure. Uh, there are many other figures, sort of, but Shaji Guru is maybe the most exalted one. There's, there's a whole line of bodhisattvas and uh, sort of more ordinary human heroes whose stories are circulating um, all over the Buddhist world. Um, medical similes, analogies, and parables that I talked about before, uh, these are frequently found all over the Buddhist world in, in, um, um, in, in all Buddhist languages. Uh, and, then, and then finally, um, perhaps Perhaps my sort of usage of the term medicine seems a little too fuzzy for you, and you want it to be sort of a little more concrete. Um, uh, maybe you know, hagiographies and, 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 and metaphors um, don't satisfy your definition of medicine. Well, there are also specific medical doctrines. Both, um, both. I, if this distinction is this distinction between physiological and ontological um, medical practices, is something that comes out of. Um, both Western and Chinese, a uh, history of both Western and Chinese medicine, that is to say, physiological um, approaches to medicine are, is uh, medicine that focuses on the functioning of the human body, whereas ontological is um, diseases that, that enter from outside of the human body. Um, and so we have a number of medical doctrines within the Buddhist um, world that, that, that relate to both of these types of logic that are um, Exchange that, that are influential um, around the Buddhist world. So I'm kind of blasting through my, my slides here, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that the, 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 the notion that there are meditations that can heal you, um, it continues to develop from, from the early Pali texts where we have examples of reflecting on a particular quality of Dharma leading to somebody's um, spontaneous recovery of health. Um, we have, over the course of the, the development of Buddhism, the emergence of all kinds of um, uh, healing meditations, which I've listed some of them here. I'm happy to come back to this slide and get into a little more detail on these specific practices. Um, but uh, um, just to say that healing meditation, the power of meditation to heal is something that's very much at the core of uh, Buddhist approaches to to, to health and healing. Um, another slide I'm not going to go through in detail, but I just want to point out that in, in addition to meditation, there are many other specific Buddhist therapies, many other interventions or practices um, that are common to the Buddhist world. Exactly what they look like might, might transform from place to place, and down, down the right-hand column here I have healing talismans from medieval China, and those look quite different from the healing talismans that we have from India or from Tibet or from contemporary Thailand or from uh, another historical or cultural context. Um, but a lot of the logics behind the, the, the use of talismans and the ways that they're created and, and employed uh, tend, to be, um, uh, tend to be shared. Um, okay, so I'm um, moving on to uh, very briefly sketching out what I see as three um, trajectories, let's say, for the history of the relationship between Buddhism and medicine uh, that, that develop in the second millennium. Um, so, again, these, these bubbles are just schematic, they're not meant to be taken literally. Uh, but there are parts of Asia, including India, which were um, uh, extremely important Buddhist centers, um, extremely important uh, um, uh, influences within this, this network that I've been talking about, which uh, over the course of the end of the first millennium and, 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 and by the year 1200, uh, um, in the case of India, are uh, no longer Buddhist. They have um, been converted to Islam, uh, and so forms of healing in this part of the world, forms of healing that, that are explicitly associated with Buddhism often are, are, are um, they, they will fade away. Um, however, if you remember back to what I said in an earlier slide, that there's a close affinity between 
uh, Indian medicine, so the types of Indian medicine that are picked up by Buddhism, there's a close affinity between that and Greco-Roman medicine. And Greco-Roman medicine is, the or is, in many ways, the origin of Islamic medicine. And so, actually, on the ground, um, it's, it, it's possible that the actual practice doesn't change too much. It's some of the framing, some of the metaphors, some of the language used to talk about these um, practices that, that, that go through that transformation. Um, on, on, so that's one trajectory. I, I'd say another tra trajectory that, that um, I see in the East Asian material is um, due to various um, uh, uh, competing um, traditions in East Asia and various translation decisions and, 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 and um, uh, various other sort of um, uh, historical accidents um, and as well as social movements. Um, a lot of Buddhist medicine in the late medieval period in China uh, starts to be expressed rather than using Sanskrit terminology, starts to be expressed in chi native Chinese terminology. Um, so by the, the, the turn of the first or the second millennium, it becomes quite common to see um, texts that are, that are engaging with many of the same Buddhist ritual, healing, and, and ideas, but, but now using the language of qi and yin-yang rather than the language of four elements and doshas from, from India. Um, so as, as um, the second millennium continues, um, the Indian uh, doctrines often drop out or else they become, they, they become um, sinicized or they become rewritten in a Chinese idiom uh, within, within the East Asian text because a lot of um, a lot of East Asian Buddhism it derives from China, then uh, insofar as, as that translation shift uh, happens in China, it also tends to influence what's happening in, in India, uh, sorry, in Japan and in um, Vietnam and Korea as well. Um, Japan is probably, the, hopefully some of the Japan experts in the room will be able to point out many examples of, of Japanese engagements with Sanskrit and with, with, with explicitly Indian um, esoteric healing practices all the way to the present. Um, uh, so Japan is, is perhaps a little a little bit um, uh, a, a little bit further down the foreignizing end of the spectrum than, than, than China or Korea are. Um, and then I would just want to point out this third kind of trajectory um, in places like Sri Lanka, Thailand, Burma, uh, Cambodia, Tibet, Mongolia, where this uh, Buddhist this tradition of Buddhist medicine becomes the foundation for. Uh, local traditions of medicine that are still being practiced down to today. So in, 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 in these parts of the world, you find um, still in existence uh, um, Buddhist inflected or Buddhist influenced forms of traditional medicine that share quite a bit of um, conceptual, metaphorical, as well as, as, as practical um, material with one another. Um, that, 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 that is due to this common origin in, in uh, uh, Buddhist transmissions. Um, so I don't want to give the impression that, that there stops being circulation of knowledge between these different regions. Um, in the second millennium, we have uh, scholars who have studied the uh, transmission of Arab and, Ch and Chinese and Buddhist medicine from, uh, uh, from the Mongol Yun Dynasty over into Japan. Uh, we have scholars who have looked at the um, exchange of Vietnamese medicine with Ming China. We've had the uh, scholars who have looked at Tibetan um, exchanges of medicine with Qing China. Sorry, all my examples are China. This is um, just just some examples that I'm giving here. There are plenty of examples of other circuits of exchange that, that um, continue through the second millennium. Um, but what I wanted to do was quickly just kind of like, like um, close out with a discussion of the modernization and globalization um, in the, the 19th and 21st century, and then we can get to the, the discussion. Um, in the 19th century, there are um, all around the, the all around Asia, there are many um, instances where uh, Buddhist medicine in a colonial context becomes problematic, becomes superstitious, it becomes something that needs to be eradicated. Um, just some examples that I've looked at are um, the activities of missionaries in the 19th century in Thailand, uh, as well as the Meiji reforms in, in Japan, both 
both in both cases, uh, Buddhist healing, Buddhist healers uh, became objects of ridicule um, in in major Japan that became outlawed um, uh, as as um, uh, inferior superstitious approaches to, to healing, obviously in favor of um, biomedicine. Uh, and then I, I wanted to draw attention to this kind of remaking of Buddhist healing that, that takes place in many in many um, contexts. And um, I'll just give you one example of early 20th century China, um, this reformer, uh, Taishu, who in the first half of the 20th century is involved in reforming Buddhism um, to, to sort of speak to a modern modern concerns, modern audiences. And um, our colleague in, in uh, religious studies, Eric Hammerstrom, has written a great book on Taishu, where one of the chapters is dedicated to the reform of um, the reform of Buddhist uh, meditation and philosophy into something that's compatible with psychology. Um, he's written another chapter on um, um, the reform of Buddhist notions of cosmology uh, into something that's compatible with, with um, physics and chemistry. Uh, one of the examples he gives, which I love, is that, that um, uh, there, there is this famous passage that appears in multiple different places in Buddhist literature uh, where the Buddha says that, um, you know, with his, with his enlightened eye, he can see uh, all of these tiny little worms or tiny little um, bugs or critters that are infesting your body, that are found in every nook and cranny of your body, and even in a glass of water, there's, you know, I think it's 84,000 of these little um, uh, critters in, in the glass of water. Um, this is a long-standing Buddhist idea. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's elaborated in all kinds of literature from Tibet, from China, from, from uh, around the Buddhist world. In Taishu's hands, of course, this becomes an argument for how the Buddha could perceive bacteria long before, uh, long before the Western world, you know, or modern science was able to um, develop that technology. Uh, so it's an example of, I, I think there, there are two different things going on here in, the, in this period of modernization. One is the repression of Buddhist ideas, and the other one is the, is the remaking of Buddhist ideas to fit with, uh, with modern science. Um, I, I, I'm just going to show you um, a uh, table of contents for a book from the 1960s from Japan. Um, and it's in this period that I identify, was able to find this, the emergence of this category of Buddhist medicine um, in, in Japanese language first, and then I see it in Chinese language, and then it appears in English. Um, this book in the 1960s, if you look at the table of contents, um, you can see quite clearly that, that this book is attempting to reorganize Buddhist knowledge along the lines of, of, of modern clinical biomedicine, right? This is a, like a directory of the hospital, right? Um, and, and so within each one of these sections, what the author does is sort of like call through the Buddhist canons in, in various languages and arranges all of the quotes and the citations under these headings. Um, and so I'm, I'm arguing that this is a sort of a reconfiguring of uh, Buddhist healing knowledge to fit within a, a, a modern medical framework. Um, what's interesting to me about that is that this process that I've been talking about from the reformers like Taishu in the previous slide through the 1950s and 60s um, uh, emergence of this category of Buddhist medicine, in a lot of ways, so this does um, um, historically proceed, but in a lot of ways it, it, it sets up uh, the, the groundwork for the psychologization of meditation that takes place in English language discourses in the 1970s. Um, so it's in the 1970s that um, uh, American writers pick up on this category of psychology um, and the correlations that are, that are being made already in Asia between modern psychology and meditation and start to build out a, a, a a understanding of meditation and the benefits of meditation that are going to lead directly uh, to the mindfulness protocols that we that we have today. Um, those mindfulness protocols created in the late 70s have become uh, more and more prominent. As I mentioned earlier, um, they've become quite uh, quite sexy with their brain scans and the and the um, um, uh, the, 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 the the research um, and so. By, by today, by the, the 2010s, um, it's, it's quite obvious that this um, emphasis on 
uh, biomedical research, emphasis on um, neurological research and meditation, is now playing a role in, in sort of a countercurrent movement, uh, is now playing a role in the way that meditation is talked about and taught in Asia. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm transitioning now into a little bit of anthropological, ethnographic research that I've done recently um, in Korea, where um, I've been visiting um, modern Buddhist institutions, temples, meditation centers that are explicitly searching for, um, that are explicitly using MBSR and MBCT as models for the development of Korean Buddhist meditation uh, courses and retreats. Right? So there's a kind of a, uh, a I, there, there's once again uh, Buddhism playing a role in this cross-cultural um, exchange of movement of ideas about, in this case, psychology and, and neuroscience. Um, so once again, Buddhism is, is sort of this catalyst or this vehicle for that, those kinds of exchanges. Um, around, around the world, contemporary world, there are many different configurations of that relationship between biomedicine and, uh, and Buddhism. And I, I don't want to give the impression that there's sort of a, a, a Buddhist approach to biomedicine. Um, so I want to give you just a couple examples to show you how different things can be um, in, in different contexts. The first slide is just a picture of the, uh, the Suji Foundation's uh, Dharma Hall, which is in the foreground, and then their hospital, which is in the background. This is Ipwadi in, ta in Taiwan. Um, the hospital in the background is where the mosaic with the Buddha healing the, or, or caring for the monk who's sick that I started out with. That's where that came from. Um, Suji is a, a major um, international organization uh, that has um, reportedly millions of members. Um, they, they specialize in um, um, uh, they specialize in emergency relief. Uh, I understand that they were on the ground um, in in both of the recent hurricanes that we had, as well as in Katrina and all the, all the other major disasters we've had in the U.S. They're on the ground within within. 48 hours, um, but one of the things that they're very well known for in addition to that disaster relief is uh, building hospitals, and they built hospitals all over Taiwan, um, and these kind of healthcare clinics um, in Latin America, in the U.S., um, they have a major operation um, in, in Los Angeles with uh, migrant workers, um, so they're, they're a very, very strong presence kind of in the world uh, of, um, um, of uh, NGOs. Uh, and all of the healthcare that they're giving is 100% um, biomedical. It's very kind of um, mo modern, up-to-date medicine, uh, but the logic behind it and the way that they recruit their members, the way the members talk about what they're doing, the whole reason for the existence of the organization itself is it's all framed in terms of bodhisattva vows and framed in terms of um, uh, uh, compassion. Um, <clears throat> Ah, this slide isn't necessarily um, uh, on about biomedicine. This is a, a traditional medicine school in Chiang Mai, Thailand, um, and this is a, uh, a a picture of their major annual ceremony honoring um, the, the the Buddha, but also honoring the founder of the so-called founder of Thai medical tradition, who's on the right here. His name is uh, Jibaka. He's a figure out of the Pali Canon who supposedly um, was this great uh, um, physician. I have a lot to say about Jivaka. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested. Uh, but this is a ceremony dedicated to him at which the, um, the participants will invoke Jivaka's presence into the statue. And then from the statue, following the lines of string that you can make out in the background, um, the, the lines of string go all around the space. They connect all of these offerings. And then they'll eventually be wrapped around the wrists of the participants in order to um, kind of capture some of Jivaka's uh, blessings and, and, and attach them to their body in order to empower their healing practices. Um, this is quite sort of a, um, a routine, I think, but, uh, Buddhist logic behind this ritual. Um, very much uh, still alive and playing a major role in, in Chiang Mai, in Thailand, um, and this is a Thai medical school that is um, uh, is uh, licensed by the Thai government, which is one of the premier kind of institutions in, in uh, northwestern Thailand uh, that are involved with with traditional medicine. 
Um, the Menzi Khan, some of you may be familiar with the Menzi Khan, it's a Tibetan, um, the, the Tibetan medical, uh, um, I guess the center of Tibetan medicine in the, among the Tibetan diaspora community. Uh, Menzi Khan is one of the chief promoters of Tibetan medicine globally, and you can see from the banner of their website that they're very much self-consciously seeing um, what they're doing as uh, Tibetan medicine is deriving from the medicine Buddha, who's shown there, the blue figure on the, on the right, who is the traditional uh, founder of Tibetan medicine. Um, if you poke around on their website, you can see um, uh, different kinds of incantations and other kinds of rituals that you should do when you take the medicines that you can, that they have recipes for on their website as well. Um, I'm conscious of my time, so I'm going to kind of just like quickly just, just finish out by just saying that there's many different, different organizations in Korea um, that I can talk more about that I've spent a little bit of time with. Uh, the upper left is a uh, one Buddhist um, hospital that combines Korean medicine with uh, uh, um, biomedicine. The lower left is a shaman who I visited who has Guanyin as part of her shamanic repertoire. Um, on the right is Jogyasa, the major, um, the, the, the uh, large statue of the Medicine Buddha at the major um, headquarters temple of the largest Buddhist order in Korea. So many different ways that um, Buddhism and medicine are connected. Uh, and then I wanted to bring us to the U.S., um, just my, my, my last slide, two slides, um, just to mention uh, ethnographic uh, work that I've done both in California and then also in um, Philadelphia, exploring all of the many ways that Buddhists are engaging with medicine uh, beyond mindfulness. Um, so in Philly, um, I have a, a, a research project going on um, that is, uh, is cataloging the practices that relate to healing that are taking place at uh, 40 different Buddhist temples, 10 of which are primarily Caucasian, the rest are primarily Asian American uh, um, uh, communities, non-English speaking communities, and we're finding all kinds of um, practices, all kinds of resonances and continu continuities with many of the practices I've been talking about um, that are, are still um, uh, practiced um, quite widely in, in the U.S. So I'm looking at Buddhist medicine, uh, uh, the, the relationship between Buddhism and medicine, that even in the U.S. as being something that is that goes quite ways <coughs> beyond mindfulness. Um, okay, so uh, this is my last slide, and, and I'm just going to finish up by by um, just giving you what I see as the five or six kind of like um, main arguments or interventions that this project is making, um, and then maybe use that as a way of kind of launching off into a, a conversation. Um, so the first argument I've been making is from a history of medicine perspective. Uh, Buddhism has been missed entirely by historians of medicine as an important influence in the, the cross-cultural exchange of medicine uh, historically as well as in the contemporary period. And so one of my one of my interventions is to just put that back on the table as as a, con a major context in which medical exchange happens historically as well as today. Um, in the second place, uh, what I'm trying to do with my project from the standpoint of the history of Asian medicine is to maybe cut across some of the usual ways that people uh, approach Asian medicine. That is to say, normally we have the historians of Chinese medicine, the historians of Indian medicine, the historians of Tibetan medicine, and they they present in different venues and they, you know, they, they sometimes speak to one another, but they usually are publishing in silos, and I'm trying to cut across um, Asia in a different way, um, using Buddhism as, the, as the, the lens through which to look at Asian medicine as being something that's a lot more fluid and a lot more um, in, in, in circulation than the, the sort of siloed way of approaching the history of medicine in Asia would have you seen. Um, something I'm explicitly doing is uh, blurring the boundaries between the categories of religion and medicine that I think are, are all too often treated as, sub, as, as quite firmly separate things um, in the Western Academy, in the American Academy specifically. Um, I mentioned my PhDs in the history of medicine. Um, how many conversations did we have about Buddhism in my graduate uh, training? Yeah, absolutely none. How many, how many, how many conversations did we have about religion um, in my graduate training? Very few. Um, so I'm trying to cut a, 
across a, what I think is a divide that may make sense in the modern Western context, but I don't think makes sense at all in, say, medieval China or, say, in early modern um, Thailand. Um, that's something we can discuss. Um, sort of a related point is, uh, is in terms of contemporary uh, discourses around Buddhism and health, I'm trying to decenter this Western biomedical kind of emphasis on um, the, the, the neurobiology of uh, uh, and the psychology of, of mindfulness by looking at um, a wide range of other ways of engaging that, that are um, out there. Um, Specifically on that point, in my work in Philadelphia, um, looking at trying to amplify uh, the, the voices of the Asian American community, the uh, non-white, non-English speaking uh, communities in Philadelphia, and trying to put um, some of their stories um, into uh, the conversation that we're having about uh, Buddhism and health in the US right now. Um, so that, that map that I showed you of Philadelphia is just a screenshot from a website that's under development right now. Um, we are um, uh, currently engaged in, in recording, uh, audio-visual recording, as well as photography, as well as ethnographic um, reports from these temples to try to uh, capture some of these voices and put them into the conversation. Um, and then finally, one other thing I'm very interested in doing is kind of opening up this area of, of the relationship between Buddhism and medicine as a site for interdisciplinary conversations and research. Um, as, as, as Lance said in the introduction, that I, I'm kind of like carving out Buddhist medicine as a, a, something of a, of, a, of a common project and inviting people to come and participate in that project from various venues. And so books like the one that I just published in, in the second volume, bring together historians, uh, religion scholars, philosophers, um, practitioners, uh, and, and, and give, give a place, a site for these interdisciplinary conversations to take place, um, something I'm very interested in doing, some, something that is um, very um, fulfilling to me as a scholar, also as a person, to sort of um, approach problems from different perspectives um, and hear what different disciplines have to say about it, uh, which is why I'm super excited about um, Michael's comments and the conversation we're going to have and the opportunity to come and blast through this material very quickly. Um, like I said, I hope I left a lot of breadcrumbs that you all can pick up and we can talk about. I'm, I'm really interested in um, the conversation. And thank you. have uh, a few words. I think that, that I think something that's been a big elephant in the room is also this kind of discomfort with that comes with classification and forced classification, especially in, in 20th century context. But yeah, Michael, if you have. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I should warn you, I feel uniquely, uniquely uh, unqualified to be up here, but uh, I've known Pierce for quite a while. and. Uh, I thought if I agreed to be the discussant, that he'd be sure to come. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I agreed. Uh, before I begin, I'd, I'd just like to emphasize, I don't know if everyone in the room quite understands what we have here. Uh, the idea of someone doing both Buddhist history and history of medicine it's, itself Huge, but within that, I don't know anyone that uh, goes as far as Pierce goes across so many different cultural traditions, Tibet, China, Japan, India, and then across such a vast uh, time frame. So it's, it's, it's really astonishing. Uh, but I think only because he does that is he able to take on these very, very big picture questions that the rest of us somehow never get to. I mean, my own specialty is Japan from the 7th century up to the 10th century. So if it's an 11th century question, there are other people in this room I want to leave that to. Uh, but uh, 
Pierce doesn't do that. And for that, I really, really think we should all just be very grateful. Uh, and also, because of just the questions he's ra he raises and what he shows us, it's, it's very fruitful. And he has, uh, I've known Pierce, I think, since the Medicine Buddha Conference in Korea. We sat on the bus together for, for a good ways and talked, and I thought, wow, we've got to get this guy to work into a talk. But he's changed the way I think of Buddhism in some, in some basic ways, which uh, I'll talk about here a little bit. And then I'll raise some questions, probably none of which Pierce wants to have raised, because he's probably heard them a million times and because they're probably difficult to answer as well. Uh, what I'd like to begin with is uh, just talking a bit. I'm, my, the comments I made are, I should, point, should say, are responding to a paper that Pierce sent me, which is very rich. Uh, it's a little bit different from what we heard today, but um, very, very much on the market to, in terms of what his concerns are. Um, but what I'd like to begin with is uh, what I know least about, uh, which is the modern period and the uh, transformation of uh, Buddhism within uh, Western discourses. And one, one thing I would like to point out, the, the dangers of, of doing so much is that there are always just so many voices within, within any particular movement. And one problem that I think we need to be sensitive to is that even just today, with the reinvention of Buddhism or Buddhist medicine, or Buddhism as a tradition with a medical tradition, et cetera, et cetera, is just the multiplicity of voices within the Buddhist tradition. And how local voices might see the same event very differently from the way we look at it here in the West, or here how we look at it as academics, or how we might look at it in terms of people who are interested in the history of medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So just to tell you a little story, um, my wife is from Taiwan. And uh, we got married 20 plus years ago. And at the time, uh, the Zhiji movement in Taiwan that Pierce was talking about was really taking off. And just about every other street corner you could find in Taipei had a receptacle, and you could put in clothes or anything that you wanted to donate. And Zhiji was just like, go, go, go. And they were going to spread healing. They were going to spread uh, material benefits to the world. And they were going to spread Buddhism. And I was having lunch one day with my in-laws just gotten married. I did not want to offend these people at all. My wife wasn't there. And the conversation turned to the fact that they had some old clothes they were going to get rid of, they were going to donate. And they started telling you about Zhiji. And what they told me was, what we Christians don't understand is that Buddhism, Buddhism alone, values compassion. And Zhiji was going to become the dominant force in charities across the world. Because it was Buddhist. And this was Taiwanese Buddhism, and Taiwan was a Buddhist country. And my father-in-law concluded by saying, soon Zhiji would be second only to the Red Cross. <laughs> and to my credit, I think I did point out to him that actually the Red Cross has some slight connection with Christianity. <laughs> and he was like, it's not just the United Nations. He said, no. I didn't go into the whole missionizing movement, et cetera, et cetera. But from their point of view, what we think of as an experimentation in modernizing can look, from the local point of view, as taking something essential the essence of Buddhism, and then reading it in terms of things like growth, dynamism, and continuity. This is where Buddhism was going to 
take off into the world. Now we're seeing how Buddhism is transforming itself in order to make accommodations or adaptations with Western medical knowledge. So one question I have that I think I would like us to think about is basically how how we situate all of these discourses that we're talking about. And is it fair to impose one rubric of, say, medicine, or terms like, say, must Western medicine or Buddhist medicine? How, how do we use these terms when we talk about different particular local contexts? Second thing I wanted to just bring up, and, and again, I, I'm sure Pierce has dealt with this a million times before. Um, but when we speak of medicine and Buddhist medicine, um, and Pierce is very, very aware and very sophisticated in talking about it as modes of healing which are related to the Buddhist tradition. And he speaks a lot about, and talk today about, say, humors, theories of humors, and the Greco Roman tradition, the Indian tradition, Qi in China, etc., etc. But I would suggest that when we actually look on the ground, we find that in addition to all of this, there's also something else, which is demons, spirit. And I don't know how much sense it makes to speak of Buddhist healing without speaking about these practices. When we speak about Buddhist interactions with other traditions, say Buddhists and Taoists, etc., and in his paper, Pierce talked about this. It tends to be people borrowing templates for spirit exorcisms. And they were on the slides that, that Pierce brought up. But one thing that I think this sort of project should do is not only allow us to appreciate the Buddhist tradition in different ways, but also it should make us uncomfortable and make us, in particular, uncomfortable about how we think of categories like, say, medicine and healing, and are we going to allow space for spirits, or are we going to insist that when we look at Buddhist medicine, it's only uh, something which could roughly be transcribed into some sort of clinical Western practice. Finally, uh, I have just one more question, and then I really want to stop what I would really like to do, because there are people in this room who are doing Buddhism and medicine, and I'm not one of them. I'm looking at you, Andrew McConaughey. <laughs> and Bernard does Buddhism and neuroscience. Um, I'd like to raise the issue of what is at stake in all of this? And is there simply a question of how do we see different therapeutic techniques transmitted? Or um, to what degree can we see these discourses as related to the issue of what do we consider health to be? Both in the sense with the Buddhist context of what are the different Buddhist conceptions of the body, whether they're tantric or early Indian or Japanese, etc.? But also, what do we consider healthy to be? And how do these issues play into other issues that, say, my Taiwanese in laws take for granted, which is to say that medicine, of course, has something to do with charity? Medicine, of course, has something to do with notions of compassion. Medicine, of course, has something to do with issues of merit. So uh, these are issues that I just want to raise. Uh, I don't have any answers, but uh, I will say that 
Pierce has convinced me that it is a mistake to look at the Buddhist tradition, specifically, without thinking of these issues, without thinking of, in terms of health and medicine. My in-laws probably would not have been particularly bothered at all if you told them that the Ziji movement is invested in promoting Western biomedical practices. They would have been upset if you told them that they were not promoting health. And the idea that Buddhism could be separate from healing, I think, would be very uh, foreign to them. And I think that's a rather fundamental part of the Buddhist tradition per se. So how this all plays out, I don't know. Um, but as I said, I'm simply inbounding the ball here. So I'm going to say. So um, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about, um, I mean, there's so many really interesting um, questions and, and, and thoughts that, that you're raising. I love this, this story that you're talking to um, about the multiplicity of voices. This is exactly, I think that question is exactly what's at the base of the work that we're doing in Philadelphia right now, is, is um, really trying to um, pro provide space to hear these these conflicting voices and these these um, um, multiplicities, like you mentioned, um, and it, it's really been fascinating to me um, to hear, you know, temple goers from the same temple speaking about these rituals of healing or, or practices of healing in very different ways, even from one another. Um, and, and, and as part of our um, part of our, our interviews, we've been so far focusing on the, uh, rep the temple representatives, so that is the monastics or else the lay people who are sort of assigned as the um, liaison for, for us, and we haven't been going yet, and um, um, except at one temple, we haven't really gotten down to the level of individual members yet. Um, but even just at that sort of like quasi-official level, we will um, frequently uh, go to a temple and start asking about health or about um, how does Buddhist practice promote health or something like this. And, you know, one person will say, oh, no, well, you know, um, you know, if somebody's sick, they need to go to the doctor. We only, we only do things to support, you know, spiritual and mental well-being. Meanwhile, there's some kind of exorcism ritual happening right on the other side of the, of the hall. Um, to to uh, alleviate a woman from a ghost that's been causing this recurring illness um, for one of her children, right? So there's there even within the same space these multiplicities, um, 
and, and that's to me, that's a, a large part of, I guess, the ethnographic work right now is really about adding more voices, and I, I, I'm not ready, I don't think quite yet, to be sort of telling overarching generalized stories about, about the contemporary um, um, uh, sort of, I don't know, ecosystem or the contemporary world of, of, of um, uh, Buddhists engaging with medicine, even just in this one city. Um, but I, I do think, I do think as, as we hear these voices and as these kind of these, these different perspectives come out, um, that I think you know it's 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 throwing into question exactly the same sort of categories that that the, the history throws into question is what you know what do we mean by medicine what do we mean by religion what do we mean by 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 health um, what do we consider health to be that's the way you, the, the way you put it um, so so for me I, I don't I don't have answers yet to those kinds of questions I'm just really interested in in, in how that those questions keep coming up for Buddhists, um, and they keep answering or, or trying to answer those questions through the um, frameworks that are provided um, by, of course, by, by many other facets of culture, but, but there is a sort of a recurring kind of thematic refrain um, within the Buddhist tradition of, of Buddhists throughout history as well as today, trying to grapple with these questions through these Buddhist frameworks, and that, that's kind of what I think is um, emerging from from, from that work um, to sort of look across the whole you know span of historical as well as as, as contemporary voices. Um, uh, so so anyway, so I don't I don't have sort of concrete answers on that yet, but it's I think it's it's that's those kinds of questions are exactly what I'm interested in engaging with. Um, and, and and to wrap that sort of around into into your question too is how does this research help with contemporary uh, clinical setting. So, um, my my reading of let's say textbooks for medical students is 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 not nearly as in depth as my reading of lots of other types of material. Um, but 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 I have frequently come across um, whether it's in textbooks or online um, resources or if it's in books written by physicians and researchers. Uh, um, as well as popular media representations, that there, there, there is kind of a, um, a, um, uh, a, a stereotyped way of answering what it is that Buddhists have to say about health. Um, so if I've looked at many of these kind of guidelines for physicians for dealing with Buddhist patients, right, and then it's, you know, Section one on the Four Noble Truths, section two on the Eightfold Noble Path, right? And it's this very kind of formulaic sort of um, uh, approach to what Buddhism is. Um, and then, of course, all the research on mindfulness is, is now finding its way into those kinds of into those kinds of documents, right? So, um, I guess I guess I'm asking the same questions that, 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 that you are, Mike. I'm asking what where are the demons in this description, right? Because they're 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 all over this material. Um, whether it's historical or, or contemporary, um, when I talk to Buddhists, that's you know it's that's a major thing that they want to talk about. And I should mention when I when I said earlier about well, these two modes of therapeutics, you know, it's just using kind of a easy way of summarizing it to say that there's functional and then ontological. Right? One is focused on the sort of physiology of the body and how the physiology works, and the other is ontological. Um, approaches to medicine that is recognizing disease as something that comes externally and enters into you and causes disruptions, whether it's germs or, or viruses or whatever. Um, in the Buddhist case, it's frequently demons. That's the most common ontological understanding of how disease happens. Right. So, so many of the texts will actually kind of provide um, dual instructions. Right. So this is the this is the ritual that um, you bathe in these medicines, or you take these medicines, um, and then you do these chants, right? And it will rectify both the four elements and dispelled ghosts, right? Or dispelled demons. So a lot, a lot of Buddhist therapeutics has have these kind of two, um, these two sides to them. Um, so, so yeah. So I think you know what's at stake here. I mean, I think your question was sort of more philosophical. Yours, I think, is a lot more practical. Like, what's at stake here when I'm meeting with this patient 
um, you know, and how, then how do I approach them? Um, and I, I just, I, you know, I think what's at stake here is, it, yeah, it's, a, it's at stake is uh, our understanding of what health means, as well as understanding, the Buddhist understanding of what health means. Um, so, anyhow, I, I don't know if that's, uh, so my, my, my initial thoughts on that. Just to piggyback on that, yeah, it's 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 interesting also that like and everybody has a ghost story when you go to Thailand. If you don't have a ghost story, then you're kind of just not part of any conversation really. Um, and even when I was talking to um, uh, Ted Kapchuk, who's, trans who's translated what we have in Weaver, um, when he gets to demons, he just decides to leave them all out, um, and he doesn't know what to do with them. But he's also head of the placebo study centers at, at, at Harvard, trying to destabilize biomedicine. But yeah, if there... So, so oh, you have a... Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think you guys are all for the interesting questions. And one question I have is that I know uh, your work is uh, based on the translation process of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist medicine from India to China. And we are now in the time that like, Buddhist healing practice I would say, is also like transmitted from the Eastern to the and some people will say that this is like a procreation of Buddhism into Western, um, uh, Western world, but like in, some people in defense of that would also say that, well, that happened like uh, 100 years ago in China as well, as you pointed out that like the, when people uh, do the, did the translations, they use uh, Chinese uh, terminologies, terminologies that was orig originally from the So, um, I, I'm going to duck the question by saying that since, so I, I, as I've, I'm a, a, a scholar who's observing that process, I, I don't necessarily want to have a, a horse in that race, right? And, and to decide one side versus the other. What, what I'm most interested in when I look at translation, when I'm looking at um, either the translation in the case of medieval China, of Indian materials, or the translations that are happening both of historical Asian Buddhist texts in contemporary U.S., but then also kind of American-style MBSR back in Asia. There's, there, there's multiple directions to these arrows. Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm, sort of my first impulse is usually to look, to look at the, the translator and what kind of social positioning the translator is trying to do using these texts and what kinds of power structures the translator is embedded in. Um, and that usually helps me to, to sort of think through some of the kinds of issues that you're, that you're talking about. Um, so I think you're, you know, I, I think that particular, in that particular uh, case, we want to really like look at, you know, which exact translator are you talking about? Because what John Kabat-Zinn is doing is quite different than what a uh, writer for the Huffington Post is doing. They're embedded in quite different, um, social and, and political kind of configurations, if you know what I mean. Um, and so, um, I think, you know, Michael, Michael's example about Suji and the way that that is perceived, you know, within a sort of a, maybe a quasi-nationalistic, uh, but definitely Buddha-centric yeah. kind of um, uh, discourse, right, is quite different than the way, um, you know, uh, another person is speaking about, about Suji you know, in, in uh, you know, suburban Los Angeles, right? They, they, they could be quite different. Um, so I would just look at the, I kind of rephrase or reframe the question in terms of like, which specific translator, um, and, and then look at what they're trying to do with that material. Does that make sense? I know it's a non-answer, non <laughs> or a deflection of what you wanted me to say. <laughs> Oh yeah, thank you. Oh yeah, that's not a Okay. Great. Um, Robin, yeah. Thank you, Pierce. Yeah. Um, having now worked with all these different scholars who have covered many different regions. Such as yourself. Um, <laughs> um I'm, you know, from from this perspective, this very 
broad perspective. You had a slide where you had these different regions, uh, you know, the, uh, was it Greco-Roman, uh, and then the Ayurvedic medicine, and then Chinese medicine. My impression is that most of the flows of medical knowledge were going from the Western regions toward China. And I'm wondering, is that partly because we're China specialists and we focus on China and we're working with Chinese materials and it's more studied than these other regions? Or is it now apparent to you, having worked with all these other scholars who come to these regions, that there's actually a, a, a flow going back in the other direction that we're less aware of? Yeah, that's, that's the, honestly, that's the question that I set out from the very beginning to try to to try to get a handle on um, many, many years ago. And, and, uh, and um, uh, the, I, I think it's a, it, I'm, I'm just going to speculate now. That's all I can do, right? And I, I'm, I think it's a little bit of both. I think on the one hand, um, the scholarship of Chinese medicine, the scholarship of, um, uh, um, of Chinese Buddhism as well are, are both characterized by just a huge amount of material that's been cataloged, that's dated, that we know the authors, that we we have, you know, keyword searchable, that, that is online, accessible, um, and the field of Indian studies is, you know, whether it's religious or, or, or medical, is, um, had, it's, it's, it doesn't have that, that treasure trove. Um, the field of Indian medicine, is anybody here a historian of Indian medicine? The field is tiny. There's like five people I can think of um, uh, who are studying the history of Indian medicine. Um, so, so I think part of it is probably it's it's a blind spot. Um, there are I have it on good authority that there are tens of thousands of Sanskrit manuscripts dealing with Indian medicine that just nobody's even looked at the titles. Never mind tried to try to look at the contents. Um, so I think there's probably a huge amount of material that we don't that we're just not aware. of. Um, on the other hand, I think there's a there's also a significant difference between the let's say the the, the, the record keeping, the collating, um, the, the, the the bibliographies that we have from China, and then and what was being done. Nothing like that being done in India. So so for those of you who don't work on China, we just we have you know catalogs of texts from sixth century. We have multiple translations of the same text that came in at different in different centuries that then have been preserved. All four or five editions of that text have been preserved over time. You know the names of the people that translated them, the dates. It's just a it's a very different world than what Indian scholars are dealing with. Um, so so I think there's a there's a big blind spot there. On on the other hand, I'm 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 intrigued, let me say. Just, I shouldn't say this in a room full of scholars because it's it, it's complete speculation, um, but I'm very intrigued by um, that possibility of, of those um, uh, re reverse currents um, and what influence they may be having on, say, the development of Tantra in, in, in India. Um, um, the similarities between Tantric practices and some stuff that happened in China several, like, Half a millennia before are, are interesting. I don't know if we'll ever solve that. Um, I don't know if we'll ever nail down concretely textual sources. I don't know what we can say about it um, as responsible scholars, but I'm, I'm just I'm still fascinated by that question after all this time. Um, anyway, that's that's my opinion. Thank you. Oh, last question. Um, I, I came into your presentation talking about decentering Western biomedical emphasis, and I'm interested in. And, uh, and how you do that now, and whether we perceive us as limited if we're not practitioners in these sort of disciplines in terms of creating that connected tissue, and perhaps like as you described, when the officials in these disciplines are speaking, can we fully understand and interpret the meaning behind these really complex traditions enough to enter? Could you mix them into a Western kind of, uh, medical setting? Yeah, so, um, so, so I, I, I didn't mean to, I don't remember what sentence I said that sounded like I was excluding 
physicians or practicing um, physicians or, or medical um, people are practicing the medical field from this conversation at all. Um, that's actually it's actually where I started um, and became a historian, and a reader of Buddhist texts just by inclination. That's what that's the direction I went in. But um, um, I'm I'm very uh, passionate. I think I would say about about the the interdisciplinary dialogue, including as many people as we can. I think you just articulated the argument for having an interdisciplinary dialogue, right? Um, that every discipline has its limitations, and, and, and I think a big part of my project is what, I'm, what I've, I've been working on, translation studies and history of Chinese Buddhism and so forth, and now what I'm trying to do with this larger project is just like create space to have those kinds of interdisciplinary conversations with everybody at the, at the table um, to talk about this. To, to me, um, I, you said this was astonishing, I think it's very kindly you, 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 you had lots of um, very positive adjectives to say about this project. I think it's probably rather foolhardy is maybe what I would have said. Um, but um, but I, I am very, um, uh, I, I, so I'm at, I'm at a humanities center and, and I'm, this is my idea of what the humanities should be doing now and into the future, is, is creating these interdisciplinary dialogues. At least that's where I see the, the humanities um, going. From where I see my place within the humanities, let's say, um, is uh, is creating these venues. And so um, I'm, I'm very interested from the stance of humanities in opening dialogues with as many, with as many disciplines um, and divisions of knowledge as, as, as possible. Yeah. So um, yeah, so, so I try to. Um, present this work in many in a lot of different venues and just sort of open up questions and I always learn a lot from what you all see in my project and I am still drafting the, the, the third volume I, I, uh, still very much a messy manuscript in progress and so um, I can guarantee that all the questions that are raised here are sort of like percolating their way down um, in the coming months and will, will definitely influence the book that I eventually write, and so thank you all for your comments and your participation, and thanks for the invitation again and for the opportunity to be here. Great, yeah. Yeah, we'll continue our interdisciplinary conversation with a special lecture tomorrow with um, Anne-Lise Francois, who's going to be talking about Fire, Water, Moon, Supplemental Seasons in a Time Without Season, followed by our regular uh, uh, seminar next Monday. Uh, on silence in the body, hypnosis, music, and pain in the 19th century. So thank you again, Michael and Pierce, for being part of our seminar, and thank you all.